Pearl Iliadis is a human rights lawyer and associate professor at the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill University in Montreal. She's with me now. Uh, professor, uh, thanks for taking time to speak with me about this new bill in Quebec. Premier Legault says he's convinced this bill to ban anti-vaccination protests strikes the right balance between, uh, look, the right to protest and the need to protect health care workers and patients. How do you see it? I've been very public about the fact that I think that it's important to have some form of restriction uh, on public assemblies and uh, demonstrations that don't really have a connection to decision makers and that filming children, for example, and going into schools is very problematic. Anything that blocks people from accessing health care facilities or intimidates them in the current context uh, is problematic. So Bill 105 it strikes to me in some respects uh, does have a positive and uh, important uh, role to play right now in controlling the current situation. Uh, there are some areas where I think it's extremely broad, mm -hmm. uh, and I think it would be very helpful uh, for the government to think carefully about uh, making sure that the number of institutions and the types of institutions uh, that might be covered by this bill uh, are indeed uh, sufficiently restricted so that they meet constitutional requirements. Tell me more about that. How do you think it needs to be you know, clearly focused on what it's actually trying to deal with? So the bill uh, applies to virtually all institutions that are health facilities or social services, uh, for example, um, under Quebec law, under existing definitions of institutions in Quebec law. Uh, and it appears to be much larger than uh, schools, uh, daycares, and hospitals. There are, for example, universities that could be covered by this as well. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about the range of institutions that might go beyond those delivering direct services, mm -hmm. um, which is the first area that I, I have a concern about. Uh, I had initially thought or understood that um, there was some sort of a restriction on the ability to to uh, seek injunctions uh, in response to the bill, but in fact, the right to seek an injunction is indeed provided for uh, under the under the bill. Um, but the third area that I do have concerns about is that it appears that all types of demonstrations that are connected with any of the aspects that might touch on any of the orders issued under the emergency power legislation um, or orders in council potentially or ministerial mm -hmm. directives, there's been hundreds of them uh, over the last year might be covered. And, and I, I'm not sure whether or not under the way the bill is currently structured, whether you could have a situation where people have been affected beyond the sort of anti-vax campaigns right. uh, who might want to demonstrate and might get caught by the provisions of this bill. Right. So the, con the concern would be that, uh, in fact, it may be so broad uh, that, uh, that it's going beyond uh, trying to deal with concerns around anti-vaxxer protests and access to, to clinics and hospitals and so on. Right. So, and 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 if, if it would be helpful, I think a practical example might might um, uh, sort of talk about where I'm. I have a concern. Mm -hmm. uh, in in previous uh, orders in council, for example, this government has ordered uh, that collective agreements or certain aspects of collective agreements uh, are were suspended with regard to uh, certain types of job classification. So, for example, somebody could be ordered to go out and deliver a certain type of service that wasn't in their collective agreement, okay? So so the right to right. freedom of association was, was therefore restricted. That's not really the kind of thing that this bill appears to be getting at, but because of the broad way in which it's drafted, uh, I wonder uh, whether or not that kind of activity, because it is generally included in pandemic measures, might somehow be captured under this bill. Fair enough. Uh, look, some people will look at this legislation and say, look, there are already provincial laws that prevent people from blocking access to schools and hospitals and clinics. So why is this bill needed? What, you know, what specifically, uh, you know, has, has sort of set the, set the scene or made the case for why these kinds of measures are needed? So that's a really interesting question. So it is true, for example, right now that under the Act Respecting Health and Social Services, you're not allowed to block access. My understanding of the concern is that 
in addition to potentially blocking access, there were also people who might not have been blocking access. They might have been on the sidewalk, but they were close enough to intimidate or mm -hmm. harass or attempt to sort of persuade people. And it's my understanding that it's that additional behavior um, that may not get caught under uh, or, or envisaged under current legislation that, that they're really trying to get at here. Opponents of, uh, of these measures, uh, we've heard from them saying, you know, that uh, protections of uh, freedom of speech are being sacrificed in, in, this, uh, in this bill. Uh, is that how you see it? Is this, a, is this a freedom of speech issue or is this a freedom of assembly issue? I think it's clearly a freedom of peaceful assembly issue. It's Section 2C of the Canadian Charter. Uh, you know, I, I always think it's interesting how issues around demonstrations get cast as freedom of expression issues. This is not a freedom of expression issue directly. People can say whatever they want to say. The issue here is where they're saying it. And the right to peaceful assembly is, is specifically about occupying physical space and where you're doing it. So this is really, I think, a fantastic example of how uh, the right to peaceful assembly and freedom of expression um, are, are, are different. I mean, obviously, there's an expressive element to this, but the, the, the core right, I think, that's at play here really is the right to peaceful, uh, peaceful assembly. Okay, uh, let's finish on this. Uh, is it your expectation that um, this law would be challenged in courts? And, uh, and if so, what, what are the arguments uh, you think the government lawyers would use to defend it? Well, given how vocal some of the uh, folks are who have been protesting, uh, my guess is that there may well be a constitutional challenge. And it's part of our democracy that even if we don't like what people are saying, even if our patience has run out, as I think the Premier had mentioned, uh, that we should tolerate peaceful assembly and we should tolerate uh, expression that we don't like. And that, I think, remains uh, a bedrock of our society, and it should be a bedrock of our society. But in cases where the rights of other people are affected, where children, for example, for no reason that's connected with, with the bill, you know, demonstrating against children doesn't achieve anything. There's no political message other than potentially harassing or intimidating children um, that may be, may be in play. So it seems to me that this bill in general strikes a, a good balance. I am a little concerned about uh, how wide the net has been spread. But normally what the courts will do in these circumstances is they will read down uh, the bill in, in, the, in the event they decide there is a constitutional infringement, meaning that they'll interpret it in a way that is necessary and sufficient for the aims of the legislation to be met. All right. Uh, lots to watch for as this uh, bill makes its way through the Quebec legislature. And Indeed. I appreciate you giving your perspective for us today and helping us understand what's been, uh, what's been happening here. Uh, Professor Eliadis, uh, thanks for your time. Take care. Not at all, Peter. Thank you very much.